So let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Because of the theme of the conference is from the Father's heart, let's just give thanks and praise and worship to our Heavenly Father. And let's pray in our Father together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. <clears throat> and Lord, we thank you for the gift of the sacrament of holy orders, for the gift of the priesthood, the men that you have called, that you had a call on their life since before they were born. And we know they're not perfect, but we want to thank you for the gift of the priesthood and for these men who have given their lives. Without them, we would not have the Eucharist, and that means we would be without you, without union with you. We ask for your Holy Spirit to come to anoint this session, that it will be fruitful for each and every one of us. and even resolve some issues right here that we have with some priest. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for all of your guidance and your consolation and your love. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome. Quick question. Uh, I would ask you your name, but what? <laughs> what? Oh, good. Oh, we, we really need you. This is good. We needed one priest. Okay, so can I can I can I ask you can I ask you what well what's your name? Oh, Andre. Uh, Andre? Audrey. Audrey, Audrey. Sorry, I don't hear very well. At least right now. Audrey, Audrey, what what position do you hold? Where, how do you work with priest? Um, so I'm the associate director for the At the diocesan level. Okay. Okay. She's on your team? No, his team. Okay, so would you mind moving over here? We're going to do some small group things, and let me figure out, uh, just I need a second to think. <laughs> oh, I, I'm, I'm going to get to speak with you, okay? Did that sound like we're going to battle it out? That's not what I meant. <laughs> I need lots of help, so... Yeah, okay, so um, welcome. Glad you came. Okay, so everybody got handouts, right? Just uh, by way of beginning here, we're going to be focusing on three aspects. Proper attitude of working with the priest, relationships with priest, and meetings with priest. Okay? And kind of the major focus will be attitudes and then, well, Okay, so I just want to lay the context here. Um, and I am sure everybody in the room knows this, but it's helpful to put this out here before we start some discussion, okay? So at the top, I just put what the descriptor of the, the workshop is. But you can see, so I want to set the context by saying, okay, who is a priest? And then um, taking it, you know, the next step, well, okay, so who is a priest? And this is based on the catechism. I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to highlight a few things, okay? So he's consecrated in Christ's name to feed the church by the word and grace of God, okay? A priest acts in the person of Christ, in persona Christi. Okay, to serve in the name and in the person of, the, of Christ the head. Okay, in the ministerial priesthood, um, confers a sacred power for the service of the faithful 
in three means, by teaching divine worship and by authority, okay? Pastoral governance, but people kind of have problems, connotations about governance. So I, I just include the word authority, which is really a proper word too. Okay, priests are called to be the bishop's prudent co-workers. Okay, so they're, they're really the closest collaborators with the bishop. Most of you work, I work for a bishop, but his closest collaborators are his priest. We need to know that, and that's the way Christ set it up, okay? Um, so bishop, a, a priest receives from the bishop the charge of a parish co community, and he's entrusted with the pastoral authority. And so if you, you work in a parish or even at the diocesan level, it's good to know that the priest in a parish will always have the final decisions, okay? So if you're on a team per se, and you, you help him in a more deliberative way, not just a consultative way, the priest is the spiritual father. He's going to ultimately make the decisions. But obviously, he's asking you to be on his team, if indeed he has a team, um, or even just, you know, to serve in the parish. Um, he has the ultimate authority. Okay, and in receiving the sacrament of holy orders, there's a solemn prayer of consecration prayed where the bishop, and, and I think we join in, obviously, asking God to grant the ordinon the graces of the Holy Spirit required for his ministry. Okay, so I hope that came out in a very reverent way because as I was preparing for this, I went to prayer after one time I was working on this, and it was like I was just kind of like overwhelmed with, who these men that God had called and what God has given them in, in the sacrament. Now, we're going to come to the second half. They're human beings and they have weaknesses, and I'm not going to just do that without looking at my notes, but we're coming to that, but let's just let's sit in this for a minute, Okay? Because after the fall, there's, there's issues, right? There's problems, there's conflict, there's you know, unhealthy, disorder, whatever you, word you want to use. And that's going to be there, but God gives us the grace to, to work with that. And, 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 and just remember, when we go to the next part, well, we have issues too, and we have problems, and we have weaknesses and sin. So let's, let's just keep this balanced, okay? Now, that's not to say if some priests have some serious problems, then maybe, maybe, you know, maybe you want to go to a higher level and they need to get help. But for now, let's keep this balanced, okay? Okay, at the bottom of the first page, um, the green, green sheet on attitude, I, I do want to read this paragraph. It's by Father Paul Scalia. Um, an amazing priest, I don't know him personally, but he, uh, what he writes and what he say, says and what his father represented, I'm sure we all love him. The priest as an image of Christ is borne out in the three roles of the priest as teacher, sanctifier, and authority, echoing Christ's role as prophet, priest, and king. The gifts, the gifts of celibacy and poverty are evidence of the fatherly role of the priest. When a man gives up the natural good of marriage in the priesthood, he knows and believes that souls are worth it. He is freed up to sacrifice himself for his flock. Spiritual fatherhood stems from a priest living a celibate life and being confident that new life comes into the world through grace. Let me read that sentence again because that took me a while. I mean, it doesn't seem 
difficult to understand now, but for me, the first time I didn't really get what it was saying. Spiritual fatherhood stems from a priest living a celibate life and being confident that new life in Christ comes into the world through grace. Celibacy becomes a sign of that spiritual fruitfulness. The priest is not relying on his own powers to beget life, but he's relying upon grace. Voluntary poverty is connected to the notion of spiritual fatherhood. In a life of poverty, the priest is not relying upon how much he has. He is relying on grace. Now, I don't want to underplay that probably some of you, maybe all of you except me, because I already went through what we're going to, little exercise we're going to go through, and, and the Lord showed me, like, you know, what, what's going on in my heart about a couple priests. Anyway, bef- um, again, let's, let's just keep this, this balance, this respect, uh, and, and mostly an awe for the sacrament, okay? But again, not downplaying problems and issues because that's what this is going to hopefully help with. Okay, so uh, next side. So the other side of the coin. A priest is also a fellow human being with weaknesses who experiences conversion and routinely receives the sacrament of confession. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but you, who's in the room thinking, yeah, does he ever go to confession? <laughs> okay. But, okay, but let's again. So this presence of Christ in the minister is not to be understood as if the latter were preserved from, in, from all human weaknesses, the spirit of domination, error, even sin. Okay, the power of the Holy Spirit does not guarantee all acts of ministers in the same way. While this guarantee extends to the sacraments, Skipping down, in many other acts, the minister leaves human traces that are not always signs of fidelity to the gospel and consequently can harm the apostolic fruitfulness of the church. Welcome. You're welcome to the front. Hi. That's your gift to the front. Okay, so there's a scripture that I think helps this kind of just summarize the whole thing. St. Paul said, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. It's a good way to look at a priest, a a holy man called by God, but he's an earthen vessel. So that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not for ourselves. In other words, we need to respect the treasure of this man's priesthood, but we need to recognize that this priest lives out the mystery of his priesthood in an earthen vessel. Okay? Okay. So again, the balance, a Christ life respect for this man called by God and this fellow human being with weaknesses and sin, okay? So what does our attitude need to be toward a priest? And again, I'm not saying shove, forget some issues or problems, but just what does our attitude need to be toward a priest to keep it in good balance? We need to show respect for him as a person and spiritual fatherhood, recognize his natural and spiritual gifts and, and any particular gifts which he is not endowed, have a non-judgmental perspective about how much he is doing. I can remember one time I was thinking, yeah, I think you have a cushy life, Father. I didn't know very much. Because I called him to quote him in an article, and he started telling me a story about the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. That's what the article was on. And, he, and it had just happened recently. And he was called in the middle of the night to go to anoint somebody, and he was there all night. And then I happened to know what he was called to the next day. So it's like, okay. So we need to give priests the benefit of the doubt. We have no idea. Okay. That was already the second one. Okay. Um, so in other words, if he's cranky, just give him the benefit of the doubt. He might have been up all night. And if not, pray, he goes to confession. Okay. 
Okay, be convicted that you're on the same team. Okay, you're on the same side. We're fighting principalities and powers out there. We're on the same side, serving in, together in the same goal. Okay? And we need to have the attitude of the church that priests serve their bishops and are his primary collaborator. They're not our understudies. We don't have authority over them. Okay? Be thankful that he responded to God's call on his life. Okay? If you came just a little late, this is to set the context before we start doing some, you know, nitty gritty. As I kind of started in the, the beginning, that, that we're always going to have issues, problems, struggles, conflicts, you name it, whatever you want. But we're, we're always going to have this, okay? We don't need to write it off. We don't need to act like a doormat. But we do need to deal with it properly, okay? And I'm sure most of us are. Well, you probably are. Sometimes I don't. Okay. So next side, what I'd like you to do, you know what, let's do this before we uh, start this. So the people that walked in after I had started talking, not to embarrass you, but <laughs> how can we do this? Let's see. Okay, this is the goal. That, okay, what, this is what I don't want. I don't want you to be next to somebody that you work with, but I do want you with someone with the same position. So if you're diocesan official, raise your hand if you're diocesan official and you came, if you came late. If you, don't, if you ever your ha already have your partner, don't raise your hand. Okay, so, but you three know each other? No. Okay, so... Okay, how about you two, if you would come over here, and then if you would come up with her, do you know each other? Yes. Husband and wife? No. no. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, good. Okay, good. Good. Okay. So would you, would you, would you join with her? Would you join with her? Okay. Did you have your hand up? Would you work with her? And you have a partner, right? Yeah, okay. And you're all set. Okay, let's see. Who else? Who else? Who else? Are you diocesan? What do you do? What? What's your diocesan? Okay, would you put together? Okay, and ma'am, sorry to put you on the spot, but what's your position? What is it at a parish? At a parish. Okay, who? Who does not? Who wasn't here when I was organizing all this? And do you work at a parish? Okay, would you join with her? Pardon? Oh, you're the diocese. Okay. Father, will you be with her? Okay. Who came in that doesn't have a partner that works at a parish? Parish. Okay. Paco, would you be her parish? Uh, would you be her partner? Sorry, I'm not thinking while I'm speaking. Can I go with And do you need a partner? No, I am not. Okay. okay. And then the two of you can be together. Okay, so we're all good with twos. Okay. I think we've got it. Now, does everybody have a partner? And you're with someone with a similar position. OK. And you probably want to sit as close to together as possible. It's not like anybody needs to really hear everything you're saying. OK. <laughs> OK, OK, we haven't started yet. Wait. Okay. Okay, what I want you to do is only answer this question and don't read anything else down the page. Just this is all I want you to do. Name a situation that went well when you worked with a specific priest and then list a few reasons why it went well. Now, let me just say this. One or two words are good. You don't have to write the whole thing out because if you just put two or three words, it's going to help you know what you meant, right? Okay, so keep it really brief just so that we can keep moving. So I'll give you one minute, okay? Write down um, a situation that went well that when you worked with a specific, specific priest and list a few reasons why it went well.
Okay, everybody got it? Okay, go, one minute. Okay, so this is different what we're, than what we're gonna do with the small groups. What I wanna do is just call on a couple people. You don't have to give a lot of details. In fact, maybe about a minute max. Okay, if you could just tell us what were the reasons that it went well. Okay, uh, you were first. Oh, oh, and could you come and talk on the microphone? Yeah. Did you raise your hand? Okay. And you work at a diocese, and you don't need to tell us where. Well, you don't. Well, actually, no, you kidded this one. Yeah, it went well, so you could say which diocese if you want. I worked at two dioceses. Okay, now remember one. One minute. One, okay, so I worked at another diocese, worked really well because I did intentionally uh, look for the pastors and try to work with the pastors. So when it worked, one oh, one priest. Oh, um, okay, one priest, okay, one priest. Basically affirming that priest, you know, um, so I think that's why it went well. Thank you, Father, for all that you do, for all your work, and then start with, you know, anything else. But yes, it did work very well. Respecting uh, also his authority as, you know, as a priest, uh, as a man of God. So always in that humility and, and respect for the priest and affirmation. Okay, could you know. say one thing he did that made it work well? That he did? Uh, well, you responded very well to that. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. I'm in a diocese now, but the priest that I'm thinking of is when I was um, at a school. He was the pastor, and for two years, he was also the principal of the school. Um, and I was the campus minister. And it worked well because we met weekly together. Um, I always felt, again, he had a very clear vision, that, and he was really gifted at, at getting us on board. And so just kind of the way that our visions aligned very well. Um, and so I always, I always appreciated that I felt heard and listened to in any idea, even if I was like, I think this is a bad idea, but I'm just gonna like throw it out there anyway. I always just felt like that was, I was able to share those ideas. But at the same time, he was always challenging us to go the next level to really strive for greatness in our ministry. Um, but if we ever like had questions or, or had like struggles with that, he welcomed us to come and talk to him and be like, if you think that this idea that I have is terrible, like I, you know, let's talk about it. I might tell you no at the end of the day, but I'll I'll listen to you. Okay, before you leave, yes. Give me one more thing that you was your attitude or you know relationship with him that made it work well. My attitude towards him. Yes. And you do, did a lot of good things. Tell me one thing you did that was good, that made it That made it well. good. Um, or you were just kind of, you didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think those were incredible years of ministry. We brought, um, I brought one, one seventh grader. He was a new kid to the school, and he wound up getting baptized at the end of that year. Does that answer? Or is that not what you were thinking of? I I guess he was such an amazing priest, he brought out the best in me. Is he, that a summary? Yes, he did bring out the best in me, and I really look to him as a mentor okay. as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And you work at a school, you're a Catholic school teacher? I work teacher? at a school, but I also teach RCA. Okay. Um, the priest that I want to talk about, he was our chaplain at our high school, but he was also the director of vocations for our diocese. Brilliant. And, but what was brilliant about him is you always knew you were safe. He would take care of everything. You respected him because what do you mean by take care of everything? he was so competent and he was so comfortable in his own skin and who he was and, but yet comfortable enough in his own skin that he could respect and enter into dialogue with anybody else, even if they disagreed with him, and he would sit down and have a conversation. And we were able to talk like colleagues. Consequently, 
I not only looked at him as somebody that I could count on, but also somebody that was my friend, and we had him in our home, and he went fishing with my husband. And, you know, he still now, even though they've moved him to one of the big seminaries, my youngest son wants to be a priest, and I continue to reach out to him for advice on him because he was such, so beautifully intellectual, but he never was above anyone. He was still just right with us. Okay, when you think of something that you contributed to it, it sounds like, again, you responded to his gifts. No, 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 no. No, because he and I, we had a very reciprocal relationship. Sure. I would go down and I'd say, what do you think about this? And then okay. he would talk and then he'd say, what do you think about this? Okay. And I valued the exchange and the respect that went on. And there was even one, um, we had, there was one moment that we really disagreed on um, masculine identity and feminine identity. Because when he first started, just a specific example, maybe it's too much sharing, but whatever, we'll just go there. Um, it was about breast augmentation. And he was like, no, no, no. And we just went toe to toe. But then he came into the classroom and he talked about a soldier, a man going to war and getting this blown off or this blown off and that that could be replaced because it restored his masculine identity. And I said, well, what about a woman who's had her breasts stolen from cancer? You know, an insurance would pray to have, would pay to have that augmentation to restore her feminine identity. Oh, and he was a great listener. and. It was beautiful conversation because then he was able to come around and respected where we can, and had a whole change of heart as well. So right. it was beautiful. So your confidence and respect and that just was a, all it was part. Just a mutual respect and respect okay. together. Yeah. Okay. Paco. And if you can, of course, I want to hear what the priest did. You know how he was added so much, but also what how you. Sure. That made it good to okay, great. I was in a parish uh, working with the, the pastor on the leadership team. And uh, what I was able to bring to the table was a lot of af honest affirmation about the good that he did and a lot of honest critique of what, what he wasn't doing well. And he could receive that well because he knew I was for him. He knew I was going to cooperate with him. And we, we had the freedom to fight for the truth. Like, it wasn't once, it was many times on the leadership team. We had real conversations, but they were always respectful. Even sometimes they got heated. But that didn't make any difference because he knew we were for him, and, and sometimes it was like this, okay? He'd say, I want it this way, after a long conversation. Then that's okay. But if it didn't work, he had the humility to come back and say, it's not, it doesn't work. And we didn't say, ha, 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 ha. No, rather we said, okay, how about looking at it again the way that we, we were proposing it? And that relationship, uh, the thing I want to say about him was he had the maturity and the security to acknowledge the giftedness of his leaders. And he wasn't threatened by the fact that one of the leaders was actually a better teacher than him and one was a better pastor in terms of pastoral skill than him. But he used all that, and he was tremendous in, in, in encouraging others to take their place and to use their gifts. And we thanked him for it all the time. And he felt, he felt our loyalty, he experienced our affirmation, and our 100% commi commitment to the mission with him. Great, thank you, Paco. Okay, moving to the next step now, what I'd like you to do is take about five minutes and let's just have it completely silent if if you get finished early then let's just keep it quiet because this is this is going to be some holy ground here that you're going to walk through and answer I think it's six questions and it's about a situation that hasn't gone well okay and it's it's kind of a two-sided you know what why but but also what was your, what's your attitude or what was your attitude about it? Okay, um, I just have to tell you, I practiced myself just to, you know, is this gonna work? And I was like, okay, I think I need to go to confession like in 15 minutes. Anyway, it, it's just really helpful. Now that's, you know, whatever. But it, it's just a really good, you know, 
is he maybe making mistakes will possibly or is he maybe not able to do his job as well as he used to because he's got all these health issues or is he this or is he that is he immature because he's only been ordained two years he you know he's growing into his priestly identity whatever but let's just walk through it and kind of find out some things that that we can let go of and it changes the situation Okay, so again, about five minutes, and then I'll lead you into what we're going to do. It seems like you had very good discussion. So, sorry I'm going to do this, but um, I'm going to call on two people just to give me one reason. Hopefully, you found this helpful. Heather, one reason. Do you need a little time to process or no? Okay. Um, oh, oh, could you stand up then? So I found this helpful, um, first of all, to make a new friend. And second of all, to realize we are not alone. So I think a lot of times we end up in kind of like a, a very lonely place in church ministry. As a professional Catholic, you, it's weird to relate to sort of regular Catholics sometimes. <laughs> So it's nice to meet other people that are having the same struggles. Maybe their names are different and their situations are different, but the flavor is the same. <laughs> and so there's that. Um, and I think the solutions are also the same, which we talked about. Um, we, uh, we are on the same team with these priests that we work with and for, and we want the same things. And they want the same things too. And it's a matter of kind of getting over the quirks that we are as humans to serve the Lord together. And I think that's, in the end, that's really the fundamental answer to all of these difficult spots. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Emily, would you come up and give one reason why this was helpful? Thank you. To, to work through this. Yeah, I think um, at the end of the day, we're both human, and to recognize that we have been called to different vocations within the church, but they are both equally very important and actually meant to work in relationship with each other. Um, I'm also a big Brene Brown fan. Thank you. And so uh, she, uh, yeah, that's a whole nother workshop. Um, but if, so Brene Brown is like a social, like, technically a social worker, but she considers herself like a professional storyteller. So she is real big on vulnerability. And uh, I've found in approaching a priest to say, you know, I, I want to support you, but I need you to know that I've been wounded in this way and I'm working to get past it. But I, I need you to hear this from me because part of my healing is to share that I've been wounded in this way. And I found, uh, I've had to do that a couple, I was sharing, I actually had to do that with my vicar. And I didn't know if I'd have a job because he, he's kind of a gruff man. But um, especially as a woman, I think sometimes priests, um, there's a little bit of a wall there because there has been, uh, you know, culturally, society, there's just, there's a wall. And so there has to be a place where we can come to an understanding of respect, but also a place where we can say, I, I need you to understand that um, to work together, we have to have mutual respect. And I don't want to be a priest. I am not trying to be ordained, but um, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm living out my vocation, and I desire holiness and communion with God in the same way you do. And we can actually help each other be better in this way. But um, to own, I think, to, to be willing to be the first person, because what I found a lot of times priests avoid conflict because they don't know how to resolve it very well or it's uncomfortable. So sometimes we have to be the first person to go and say, I, I really need to talk to you. And maybe it's confession. I don't know how you want to do it. But I think to own, not to place blame, but to just say, I need you to know that this really hurt me. Um, and, and it probably hurt me because I'm dealing with some of these kinds of other wounds, but I need you to know that, that when you did this, it struck me this kind of way, and I want to trust that you didn't believe or intend to hurt me that way, but I just want you to know in your role as a pastor that it's important to be aware of some relational key things like this, especially towards women. So, Thank you, Emily. Beautiful. Okay, two things I just want to say. This is a, a little bit of a tangent, but very important. You should not 
should not go to confession to the priest you work for. Okay? That's just an unwritten rule. Okay, and then to close this out, um, to close this out, I think I need to add a question at the bottom for no matter what the situation is that you know we're all dealing with different situations, but ultimately. You know, we, we can't change another person, but we can change ourselves. And so what I'd like to add at the bottom, if you'd like to add it, have I prayed for this priest? Okay? It's a very good question to get to because, you know, talking about him or being angry or, or, or whatever it is not going to resolve anything. In, in fact, Satan is actually winning. Okay. But if we pray for him, the situation will start changing because we can change ourselves. Okay. And remember, as long as we're on planet Earth, whether it's your best friend or not, sometimes it's going to feel like sandpaper, the relationship. Okay. And so prayer helps things. Let's move to the next handout. Working with priests, building authentic relationships. Okay, so again, keeping in balance, we need to respect the treasure of this man's priesthood, but we need to recognize that he lives out the mystery of his priesthood in an earthen vessel. Okay, so how do we develop authentic relationships? Many things have already expressed the same things. Number one, show regard for his person, okay? With sincerity, ask him how he is doing. One of my prior pastors, I saw him, and... He's, he's overly blunt and maybe with me because I feel like I do know him, but he's, you know, anyway. So I asked him how things were going at the parish and I hadn't seen him in a really long time. And it, I think it really deeply hurt him. I wasn't asking how he was. I was asking how the parish, you know, how's it going there? It's a, it's a tremendous parish. But anyway, just that, that has struck me that you know, to keep this balance, look, this priest is not going to be my buddy and my best friend. I'm not going to go out to dinner with him, you know, socially. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Okay, but as a human being, that this, this, is, a, this is a person, a child of God, and, and above all, called by God to serve us by giving his entire life. Okay, take note of one of his interests, and at the right time, in, at the right time in the level of relationship, you know, ask him about it. If he's, you know, got a picture of golf clubs or something. I mean, I'm just off the top of my head. Um, does he hunt? Does he fish? Does he like to read? Does he like to travel? Whatever. You know, if you notice something at the right time in a leisurely conversation, ask about it. Not in the middle of an important meeting, obviously. Okay, and then observe the necessary boundaries. Where and when will you meet with the priest? And especially I'm talking to the women in the room, okay? Meet during business hours in a place where there are other people in the building who are aware that you are meeting, like a secretary or something, okay? If a meal will be part of the meeting, then other people need to be included if it's a woman and a man, a woman and a priest, okay? Um, if, the, if the age is close between you and priest, consider this. Does there need to be even a third person in a regular meeting? Just a possibility. Or the door's open or something like that, okay? Just, just for your protection and theirs. We live in a really kind of crazy culture. Okay, to draw this together, um, what I wanted you to do was share with somebody how do you deal with conflict and what kind of personalities are most challenging for you. But we're really running out of time. But maybe you want to just talk with somebody even while you're walking to the next session or something like that. It's helpful to, to speak it out so that you know like how you're reacting or whatever maybe, you know, and, and there's ways of improving on working on uh, dealing with conflict, okay? So just to kind of sum up the whole personality thing, uh, 
and hopefully you went back through the couple questions just to figure out maybe personalities that don't work so well with yours, okay? But the personality types of others, so God has designed us in complementary ways, and we need all the gifts, okay? So um, we need to accept and be patient, especially with other people's weaknesses, and then also um, tune into their gifts, So the next page, so in working with priests, we really need to have a working relationship, okay, and build appropriate friendships and set the proper boundaries, okay? Women above all, we need to dress uh, in, in business attire so that is modest. And in that category, I'm just going to, I'm not going to read the whole Code of Canon Law, number 519, and it's just paraphrased there, but really that summary is the pastor is the proper shepherd of the, prop, of the parish entrusted to him, okay? And you don't maybe need to say it, maybe you need to, no, to not say it, but, or say it, but that, that we recognize that and we're in total support of you as the pastor. We're not trying to take over or run the show or whatever, okay? Um, and, and acknowledge our personality types. Like my first job, at, I worked for two parishes, and this one priest told me later he, wasn't, he was going to vote that they didn't hire me. He said, just because I saw the way you sat there at the interview, and I said, what did I do? And he said, you didn't do anything. I could just tell you had so much energy, you were going to have to be tied down. I was like, what? I mean, I mean, he didn't go, he didn't quite say it that way, but it was pretty like, so, I mean, I, I kind of set out to really get to know him and let him know, look, all my energy is going to go into this program. I'm not going to overrun you or anything, but probably I was scaring him to death. <laughs> like, what's this girl going to, she's going to come in and take over was the farthest thing from my mind. Okay, so they need to know us, and they need to know our weaknesses and our strengths, too. Okay, so how do we work to priest? Just a couple words here. Encouragement, confidentiality. Probably the most important thing is support. Support. Maybe this priest isn't like the last priest we just had at our parish, but he's got gifts. Seek them out. Find those gifts and pray for him. Okay, um, a listening ear, humility, and apology when needed. And I, I would add at the bottom, I just recognized it this morning, forgiveness. Forgiveness. That we can forgive things that, that they've done maybe to us. Okay, finally, in closing, because we only really have a couple minutes, um, the appointments and meetings is based on, uh, I'm one of the trained consultants under the Patrick Lencioni method. And so that's a two day training and a for a priest and his team. So a, part, a, a colleague and I do these trainings, um, mostly in our diocese, but also around the country. We work for um, Evang Evangelium Consulting. It's Keith Borchers who trained under Patrick Lencioni. Anyway, long story short, I laid this out in somewhat in the model of this method. And so it's not like I just kind of dream this up. And, no, I, I'm on a team personally at, at our diocese. Uh, the bishop said when we came back to go do training in parishes, he said, this sounds so good. Before you go anywhere, we're going to have it done here at the diocesan center. Two teams. And so I'm on a team. It's, it, we've, we've been on uh, since 2013. And it's, it's working incredibly well. Do we have difficulties? Yes. Do we have challenges? Do we have conflict? Of course. But it's working incredibly well because of that two-day training that built, a that built, took us through a process that, number one, placed our prayer lives and spirituality at the foundation. And so we pray together. We, go, we have a holy half an hour every other week. We do some formation together. Who's got time for this? We fit it in. It's amazing. We get continue to get to know each other. And the next thing is trust 
and that trust has to continually be built, okay? Anyway, there's more to it, but this meeting, I was looking at it and I thought, wow, this is pretty darn good. Well, I, I mean, I summarized, but it's based on Patrick Lencioni, and there's a couple things like, uh, who is telling me, oh, she's not here. The, their meetings are awful, and I said, well, why don't you, you know, offer to ask the priest, maybe he just didn't know how to run meetings or he really didn't know what, to, what he's going to accomplish in a meeting. Ask if, you know, you could facilitate it. He's in charge, but you facilitate it and set up the agenda when you get to the meeting. And then do things like, oh, my gosh, for the first 10 years I was at the diocese center, I learned how to sleep with my eyes open. We had these meetings that were two hours and they were brutal because there were reports and everybody, what else are you going to do? You're trying to kind of start to convince everybody you're doing a lot, which we are, of course. But it's like, no, come on, come on. I don't have two hours to give up to do this. We have one hour a week, week meetings and we, where the Lord has taken us and we're all moving in the same direction. And because we're, we all have our own jobs, our positions, but when we do something like make theology of the body the main focus of all of our work, it's, it's coming in all the different ways then from the diocese. And we're helping in all the different constituencies. Okay, I need to get off of that. But so it, it's setting up an agenda in most cases at the meeting. It's you, us, that we write down what the main point of the meeting is. If you're just setting up a meeting with the priest, you know, by yourself, for instance, and maybe that needs to happen a lot, especially at a parish. Um, some some really good things that in our training we learned about conflict, and I just captured some of those keys. Okay when conflict arises, et cetera. Um, and then probably two of the most important things is when a decision has been agreed upon, that somebody repeats what that decision is. If not, you walk out and everybody's got their own idea what it is. Second thing is that you even write out, no matter how long it takes, sometimes an hour to get the language right, that you're not gonna, you know, turn off a bunch of people because of the words that were chosen. Okay, and that's kind of uh, right there explained what to do. Okay, I want to just close out, because I don't think we read it. We didn't. The last page of the green sheet. I just, I just think this is really helpful because it can be easily forgotten. Sorry, we're three minutes over, so we'll close. But for what are we to pray? Pray that we will see this priest as God sees him. Pray that God will allow us to see the priest's God-given gifts. Pray in thanksgiving for his faithfulness to God. Pray for him to be strengthened in his vocation. Pray that we will accept him in his weaknesses just as God loves and accepts us in our weaknesses. Pray against temptations and pray for understanding as there can always be miscommunication and ask for clarification when there's miscommunication. I mean, I don't speak and understand the way the priest I work with speak, and so I always have to, could you say more? Could you tell me exactly what you mean? Okay, close there. Sorry we don't have more time for questions, but let's pray a glory be, first of all, for all of you and the good work that you're doing. And then the pre and for the priest that you're working for, okay? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end, Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen.